Hello, friends. Welcome to World Build With Us, the podcast where we build fantastical worlds together, step by step, with help from you, our listeners. My name is Rob Hilferty, and I'm also here with esoteric eroticist Chris Prunty. Hello. In our last episode, we polished off the cultural details of the city of Hundasa. We explored the fair and righteous workings of the Triumvirate, the ruling council at the center of Hundasa's political system. We also told you where you could go to expect a damn fine bowl of oxtail stew, mm. just so long as you don't mind intense debate happening over at the next table. But let's not waste words here. In today's episode, light your first campfire, set the typeface in your printing press, and load the black powder into your hand cannons because we're talking all about technology. Let's explore and discover what kind of technology we want in our world and discuss how and why technology is so important to world building. Chris, before we get into today's topic, I've actually got our very first listener email from friend of the show, Detlef. And he says, Loving the cast. Keep up the good work. Going off of Chris's question of how to decide what technology to use, I thought I'd tell you how to go about it in my worlds. Generally, most worlds have about equal amount of technology wherever you go, unless you're going to some backwater or exotic place, or fiercely isolationist location. I use the baseline technology to allow my players to alchemate to the world and to create a world inside their heads. This allows anything that is higher or lower to stand out. Uh, due to culture or the area, varying from the baseline. An area is generally more advanced than the other because it has access to something, such as forbidden technology, ancient ruins, lost technology, uh, that no one can replicate anymore. A whole region or culture like this would serve as a character to stand out from the rest of the experiences, and it would allow them to be a fish out of water. Single sites serve as a place of mystery, giving characters an opportunity to gain advantages over their adversaries, or a way to gain insights to them. Thank you so much, Detlef, for writing in. And if you want to get your email read on World Build With Us, you can email us at worldbuildwithus at gmail.com. And I wanted to start with this particular email because I think it actually highlights a lot of the things that we want to talk about when we talk about technology in the world today. Uh, I think that what Detlef actually talks about here is, is kind of important, like creating a baseline. And that's what I definitely want to start out with. Essentially mimicking an era to create a baseline of technology for because it helps create an outline for the type of stories that we want to tell. Because technology, more than anything else really limits, I think magic as well, but that'll be in a future episode. Mm. But I think technology more than most things actually limits or, or expands upon the type of stories that you want to tell when you're creating a world. I would agree. Uh, the one thing that I find is that magic and technology do have to play off of each other because if magic is super prevalent, why do I need to build something unless it's uh, something that is a blockade in the way. Only the rich have it. Only the powerful have it. Because why is a farmer uh, tilling his soil using a plow horse when someone, a county over, can have a motorized carriage? It, it just like, why wouldn't we sure. give this guy a, a freaking uh, tractor? Or or even like, why, why have a tractor at all if you can cast magic that will till the field so much faster. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that there is, uh, I think, again, I agree with you. I think magic is really important when it comes to technology. And I think that as a result, our next episode should absolutely be magic, not just in terms of what magic can do, but where magic takes place of technology. Because I think together, like, I think together we tend to think of them as so separate, but realistically, Magic and technology are mostly synonymous in a lot of ways, or, or at least they can serve the same function. Any just... high enough form of technology is indistinguishable oh, from yeah. magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a common trope. But, uh, but I think it's actually important that we set the baseline for the type of technology that we want to start with. I, uh, I, I'm partial to something like uh, the Golden Age of Sail, which is around the time of like 1500s or 1600s or something like that. I'm partial to that specifically because it allows us for crude black powder weapons, which I'm a fan of, cannons, uh, hand cannons, arquebuses, stuff like yeah. that. But it also still highlights 
the martial aspect because I love I love melee and I love swords in my sword and sorcery type stuff. Yeah, and you can easily do that when it takes you a little bit longer to load. Right, right. I, I like the... I mean, you look at something like Blackbeard where he had eight handguns on him because each one he knew was going to be a kill or it was even more fun because it was a matter of what's the range on a pistol? It, it's It's about five feet. Like back back when it was yeah. when it was early. Going. So I shoot, stab. Right, right. So yeah, shoot, shoot, drop the gun, shoot, drop the gun, keep going. I'm just remembering uh, Reaper from Overwatch, where it's just like doop doop drop, doop yeah. doop drop. It, 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 except that's magic technology, where he just picks up or where new ones come. Well, that that's another thing is how well is technology and magic intertwined, mm -hmm. like. Do they not touch because the magic people are just like, I don't need simple tools. I can magic a fireball. Why do I need a cannon? Right. Or is it a matter of, well, like magic doesn't affect technology or you can't mix the two. I've never really liked that idea. Where you can't mix the two? You can't mix. Yeah, because I think Magitech is really fun. Like magic plus technology is... I think it exp I think it takes the two ideas and multiplies the effects that you can have with them. Something like, oh, I don't know, Warjack uh, if, from Privateer Press, if you ever played the RPG or the oh, yeah, yeah, War yeah. Game or something like that, where it's it's literally their magical mechs, but they make sense in the world and they're also big and heavy and they have a sense of weight to them. I, I like that setting a lot, actually. So I like Magitech as well. I feel like you can take an existing baseline of magic and add it to technology, whether it be advanced or not. So... Say with uh, the cannoneer person, if you were to have something that would, like uh, an invisible servant that's just packing your weapon and holding it as you sword fight with someone, that's fine. Sure. I, I, and not only that, I think, it, I think it adds a lot of flavor and panache mm -hmm. to a setting where, you know, that might not be a thing. So I have my idea of where I want to start in terms of an era that I want to kind of mimic. I, I'm aiming for the 1500s. Wh what did you have in mind? So oddly enough, uh, when you were discussing this, I really found that interesting, mainly because it allows me to, I, I like when you can create a world or create an idea, and then immediately out in the world, you see something that's reflecting that, and you can be like, oh my god, that reflects so much of what I've done, and also that's professionally done. So I'm not sure if you've seen it, but there's a game coming out like next month called Greedfall. I've not heard of this. It's set in the 1500s. Oh, no uh, only there's elves, orcs, and magic. That sounds that sounds pretty fun. Yeah, and I want to see like what they do. What kind? What kind of a game? Well, let, not to diverge too much, but what kind of a game is it? It's a from what I saw. Since I don't like looking at trailers, I usually make a judgment call of just like that looks interesting. I'm gonna put that in my wish list, and I'll look at it later. Which is um, why your wish list is way longer than mine. Wow. Yeah. Um, it's true. Yeah. No. No. I'm, Bet it is. I have like thirty-eight. I have less than ten. Okay, maybe maybe, maybe ten or twelve. Well, anyhow, um, it's supposed to be something like a Witcher-esque uh, sword sorcery. So, like a third per the yeah, third-person yeah, yeah. RPG. That's what I gathered from the trailers I watched. Okay, so it's it's almost like a pirate setting Shadowrun in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, yeah. Okay, I would say that's very accurate, but. The thing that I like about that is when I was coming up with a, a Fallout setting with one of my friends. Well, actually, he came up with the idea. Full credit to him, Rich. Uh, oh, yeah. shout outs to Rich. Yeah, shout outs to Rich. He created a town that was built around a I ICBM missile that had crashed in the middle, and they. It's a very rich idea. Yeah, and people worshipped it. People sat around it. The town was built on it. They gained power for like from uh, like a dirty reactor. I believe, but months later, Fallout 3 came out, and boom, Megaton was uh, yeah. a town that was formed around a bomb, and the thing that pissed him off was he was just like, my idea had more depth to it. You just have a, a city that people decided, just like, yeah, we're going to build around this bomb. <laughs> okay, so so do we want to set our world in a sort of 1500s era? Yeah, I like that. I okay. Like that. All right, Sword I, and Sail is fun, you get piracy, you get guns, yes. you get all the things that... What I want to explore is now that we have the baseline era, what does that allow us to do? How does that change, fundamentally change, the world in which we're building? Mm -hmm. Now that we've kind of got a solid baseline. For example, 
what excites us about this era specifically doing to the te technology? I, I said that I wanted, I liked the idea of the 1500s, 1600s because of the gunpowder aspect and also because sailing is fairly prevalent and popular and it's doable, which means that it allows us to explore other continents. That's true. That's it's true. not just a matter of being landlocked anymore. Now we can go out and explore different continents. Mm. Mm. I like it for the aspect of, of that time of where things were changing mm -hmm. uh, a lot. Like mm. uh, a farmer could now have a lot more free time due to the fact that he was doing oh so much. The printing press, I think, was becoming a lot more prevalent. So people were becoming more educated uh, and it allowed for mass media in, for the first time ever. But one of the things that I really did enjoy or what I like to do in my world is kind of a baseline and also what are examples because that's how i use it as high and low what is the highest form of technology for communication oh okay what is the highest form of technology for medication what's the highest form of technology for militarization which could be gunpowder like what are we do is it flint well getting into that those are the three. Oh, and transportation transportation is very important I, I those are those are actually excellent highlights but i do want to go back and point out just how important the printing press is <laughs> Because not only is the printing press a matter of education, it's also a way to spread ideas like a contagion. Specifically, the Protestant Reformation, the reason that it was so popular and the reason it was so effective as it was, was you could print out a pamphlet, have a preset typeface for a pamphlet, and then spread that idea the reason I mean, there had been other calls for reformation in the Catholic Church before Martin Luther. But you had to write them all out and hand them out or go yelling in a town square. Right. And you had to, and, and essentially to spread your idea, you had to make the stops. You had to make, you had to put in the footwork. And now Martin Luther is literally translating, you know, passages from the Bible and he's spreading this information through the printing press, all from the safety of Germany where he's politically protected. Whereas throughout the rest of the, you know, Catholic church's reach, if he stepped foot into Italy trying to spread these ideas, he'd immediately be hung and exiled and, and executed for heresy and worse. Thrown in the river. Uh, no, that was those were the senators of ancient Rome that yeah, were thrown in the Tiber. Did they stop doing that? Yeah, I, I think it became less of a thing. <laughs> but uh, especially in the, especially, well, I don't know how the Catholic Church works. Maybe maybe they threw a couple people in the river and didn't tell anyone. I want to know when that guy was, uh, the dead body was put on trial. Oh, yeah. When was that? I don't know. But I we'll, love it. We'll look that up later. But <laughs> but the idea is, like, look how important the printing press is to spreading ideas. And I think that that actually adds an aspect of, the, of, of complexity to the world. Yeah. Because you're allowing political, religious, and all sorts of different philosophies to be spread, like ideologies to be spread without having to travel too much, or rather without having to put yourself at risk for expressing these thoughts. How do you think this would affect our world in particular? Let, let's let's talk specifically about the printing press because I think it's I think that if you're talking about the highest form of communication, that is that is the printing oh, press yeah. in this regard. That is the best way that we're going to be spreading information. The printing press, I believe, the way that it would possibly affect our world is it allows the influence of gods to go to other cities of where they can see the tenets of anything. They don't have to visit that city to get their sacred texts, to hear their sermons. So I think it will cause a lot more of a, a melting pot to form. Around this time, I could also see a weird sense of nationalism forming where people are like, my God's better than your God. Mm. And then other ones going just like, man, their, their God does actually sound pretty cool, man. Yeah, I think it allows for a more complex political system as well. Mm. I think that very similar to how our world kind of works, there was a there was a a reliance on religion as a as a somewhat form of government. You had at least in the early medieval periods where monolithic churches were essentially sources of power, and even in ancient times you had or in ancient, let's say, uh, Greece and Rome, it was more about the power source of the country and being a Roman. And then as that evolved, it became more about being a Christian. 
and also uh, the churches and everything is where people would learn. Yeah, like, that's that's very true. The, I mean, most learned scholars came from either rich families or from learning from the church. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's kind of important. I think it adds a level of complexity here where you can, instead of, because when our world is so focused on the worship of gods, I think it's important to look at that system and say, well, what's going to be different about that? Why isn't everything a, theo- a theocracy? To go upon that, I think this would also cause the first uh, factions and everything to form outside of gods. Because people with okay. a common interest could be like, listen, gods are great. We worship the gods. But ha- what if we came together outside of our gods and, you know, we could do something where we don't have to bend to their will? Which I like is completely blasphemous, but right. That that I actually really enjoy that idea because it mirrors what I was saying earlier. Where instead of, you know, there were these perhaps outliers in religious societies, but now that they have the ability to communicate and spread their ideas, we're getting not necessarily atheistic, but God agnostic, or or rather base level no god, and then creating a power base based around that. And to go further with the fact of Age of Exploration, they could be like, all right, well, no one's really going to stand for us, so let's go form a colony where they can't find us. Interesting. That I feel like that's that's a pretty deep vein that we can mine. Mm. I, I think that that adds to... that. That's a whole extra layer that we can get into. Mm. Man, okay. The printing press, very important. We've already created a whole bunch of different aspects there to it. We can talk about it in the magic episode. Do you think you can put a scroll on a printing press and get some magic? No. Okay. I think that that is... I like the idea of a factory of magic where you have like a essentially a... The scroll works. The scroll works, but moreover something akin to an assembly line, but specifically for arcane power. Mm. Except... Again, we'll have to shelve this for the magic episode. I do, I do want to remember. I do want to stay away from arcane magic. I want it all to be divine, if we can help it. But again, that's for the magic episode. Yep, yep. I think that the, there's going to be a lot of this bleed over from uh, technology magic to magic. To death, yeah. I, I think I, because I think you're right. I think that in a lot of ways they can be interchangeable. Where this country is really technologically advanced, the other country is doing the exact same thing, but with magic. I think if I think if we go back to Keith Baker's Eberron, that actually shows you, the the ubiquity of magic as technology and how that changes the setting. When you have essentially dirigibles and trains, that's a huge game changer. Oh yeah, and I think that. By using magic as an explanation, it allows for a different type of exploration of of the setting. And I think that's really important. And speaking of trains and dirigibles, let's get to... Transportation. Transportation, absolutely. Because, transport, like I just said, transportation is huge. It's a matter of, instead of taking several days to walk from town to town, if you're taking a horse and cart or some other a type car, of... A car, a train... Right. It, it's it's a huge, huge difference. So what do you see being uh, an important aspect of technology in this world? When it comes to transportation, I, st- I, I really want the, the horse and buggy kind of thing still going on. Mm-hmm. I don't want cars, personally. I'm, I'm fine with that. I've, I don't think cars really have a place in what we're doing mm-hmm. here. All right. Train, I wouldn't mind like the first, like super rare like barely faster than than a horse it's really just the fact of uh they harness some sort of power and it can pull freight so it's it we're not at the point of transportation of of, sorry of people moving trains yet yeah yeah. people can walk faster than this train but if you're moving like 16 tons you're gonna use this to move it from point a to point b because a horse you'd break the horse well right but but I suppose that's where my brain also goes to the magical aspect. Why not just have a giant magical beast or a iron golem or something like that take the take the reins there instead, so to speak. See that that's where I believe magic tech could just combine, of where you have like a fire elemental and that's powering the the locomotive. Sure, I've I ran a set it or at least a, a country in my setting that I ran that's 
pretty similar to that idea where it's a matter of trapping an elemental into a core and using it as an, an engine, essentially. Mm -hmm. And I, I would like to try and stay away from that here just because I, I like that idea a lot and I am trying to stay away from things that I've used in the past. Although, if my idea is so good, I mean, I'm oh not going to... Uh, you, you could also do it of as far as technology. If, if we want to stay away from locomotive because that does open up a lot of things. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Yeah. The other thing that I really wanted to kind of highlight here is the technology as a way to define your world in terms of what you want to explore or what themes you want to highlight. And here, I really want exploration to be a highlight of the world. Discovering new cities and towns, discovering new gods. I think that's actually a really fun aspect of the setting in general. Hmm. It's not just a matter of oh, well, this is the god so-and-so, where you know every city, where you know every god before you enter it. I think that part of the fun of the city is exploring, well, this is a god that I, like, I've never heard of this god. I don't know what their deal is until you kind of investigate a little bit. And I think that when you have something like dirigibles and you have something like air travel in particular mm. and faster travel like trains... I think that takes away from the exploration aspect because rather than, you, now you're just blowing by chunk after chunk and exploration piece after exploration piece. All right. So he, here's a, a segue from it. Seeing how they're all independent nations, who built the roads? Well, I don't necessarily see them as independent nations yet. Okay. I actually see them more as city states a la the Hellenic League from Greece which is we have our own city slash town. We have our own identity, but, but we come together when there's like a, a, a problem. Okay. But who right. built, going back to who built the roads, however, I think that that comes down to merchants or, or okay, really good yeah, deal. Because merchants would pay for it and everything. Absolutely. So horse and buggy. Moreover, it's, it's very important to empire building getting to resources that you need, getting to... I mean, we spent a good chunk of time talking about Handasa. Handasa rerouted a river mm -hmm. for power uh, for for a power source, essentially. They're, they're going to have roads that are going to be allowing them to get resources and create public works and go from there. As far as the roads, because now... Like, with transportation, if you're not doing any sort of advanced thing beyond, say, the 15th century, sail, ships are stable, horses, buggies, they're all luxurious. You can have them, maybe have them fortify with magic so that you can have, like, a very nice wagon train of some kind. Yeah, I, I think that's a, I think that's very possible and, and likely, really. But as far as the roads themselves, I could see main uh, thoroughfares maybe being, like, pristine like smooth stone down that someone uh, either crafted, made, or to make it faster. See, I see that with cities that are focused more on either stone, earth, or engineering. Mm. I imagine that you'll see that as a highlight to make them different. Whereas in most other cities where they have different ideas, they're going to have fairly rough cobblestones, typ typical of the era. But I think that when you look at civilizations and cities that really want to focus on that aspect, I, I think you're going to see it more in earth, stone, engineering, etc. Because it's going, I think it just makes more sense that they're going to be focused on that. And based on the divinity that they're granted, they're going to have an edge in terms of using that. I, I got you. But if you were the Merchants Guild, you're going to pay the best. That's true. And I can see maybe... It, it could even be a separate road that they're like, all right, yeah, if you want to use our road, you have to be taxed. So this is actually... That brings up a really interesting point because there used to be, in more populated cities, there used to be these tracks that would go underground. Essentially, they were trolleys and subways before, the, before subways and trolleys where it would be entirely horse traffic so if you're pulling carts it's it's essentially oh. a a subway for merc for merchants for horses and that used to be a thing and i think it was wolfgang bauer who had zobeck 
where those were no longer in use, but they were still, or for their original purpose, but they are used more as like a black market type thing. Oh. So I think having something like that makes a lot of sense where you can have a lot of pedestrian traffic on top and then a lot of merchant traffic underneath. I think that in terms of technology, why not have the merchants pay for that extra money and go from there? I think that makes a lot of sense. Okay, okay. Uh, so for medical though, this is the one that I had the biggest debate. Is there, are there healers, natural healers who don't need divine magic? Or is it just like first aid, get this man to a priest, he's bleeding out? So I wanted there to be, I, I'll put this out here now. I have a problem with resurrection magic in general and in, in, in most divine healing magic. I think that it creates a low stakes situation for storytelling because why care if you're going to die, if you're going to resurrect over and over again. So in that regard, I actually love the idea of a sawbones doctor. I love the idea of an anatomist who doesn't quite know all the anatomy yet because they're using, let's just say incomplete anatomy textbooks. Mm. And not only that, you're not only having to deal with just human anatomy now, to find a doctor who's going to be able to do human anatomy, Ashbourne anatomy, Spriggan anatomy, every other race that we want to add in there. I mean, not really sure how you would even do anatomy on an Ashbourne. That exactly, and that's uh, that's the thing. I think that when we look at how technology interacts in a magical world, we assume that everything is sped up because of the nature of magic. However. It depends on the type of magic, which we need to get into next time. Mm -hmm. And moreover, you're now dealing with so many other races, you're just complicating things even further. Yeah. But do people even understand, like, what disease is? Like, is it very basic of where just like, yeah, you wash your hands? I think that they have a basic understanding. I think that it's incredibly flawed. I like that idea. And not only that, I like the idea that there's some superstitions going around where a plague isn't just microbial b bacteria it's a matter of this is a curse from an enemy god hmm. something like that i think that having a little bit of ignorance is fun because having unanswered questions is fun having problems arise from well we have to amputate because that's the only way we know how and not only that having there not be an option well we'll just have a god fix your arm later i w i don't want that to be in the setting because i think it adds for I think it adds a lot more flavor to the uh, to the world in general. Okay, so I'm I'm not sure if this meets the the setting of the 1500s, but I'm picturing as much medical knowledge as maybe a 1700 doctor uh, or 1800 doctor of where you have the sawbones, you have it just like drink this. I understand what a tourniquet does. They do understand anatomy. But very crudely, because depending on what doctor you get, because it could be like, oh man, no, I'm I I know humans, man. Um, do you do I like use weed killer on you when you're sick? <laughs> okay, I can see that something something akin to slightly more advanced in terms of medical knowledge overall. But and I know perhaps you, it's go ahead. and I know you don't want uh, divine magic, but I feel like maybe one or two little cantrips inside where like if you're going to like the good doctor. Like mm -hmm. I'm talking about like the president goes to this doctor. He's just like, all right, yeah, let me, uh, let me just get this divine essence out. There you go. There you go. You're, you're, you're not a hundred percent, but you know what? I just made it that you won't get infected. You're welcome. So you're looking again, we're looking at the blending of magic and technology. I feel like you have looking. to do that. We, we do. This is, this is becoming a half and half episode about technology we're, and magic. We're drawing we lines. Have to talk about we're it. drawing yeah. lines. We, we have to talk about it. I agree. But, man, this is... Because here's the thing. I hate when you're in a, in a game or a setting and you as a player come up with just like, all right, what if I did this with this magic thing? And you're just like, why isn't everyone doing this? Yeah, I, I, I find that to be really annoying as well. Or give them a reason as to why that isn't as widespread as perhaps it should be. Yeah, it's kind of like bag of holding uh, and portable hole. I can make a, a missile. I don't think that's how that works. No, no. If you put it inside the that's bag not. Of it's no, no, no. You're thinking of you're thinking of the arrow that they create. Yeah. yeah no, that's not. Yeah, I, I understand. But I mean, you put that on a ballista, and then boom. 
Right. I, I, I understand, but I, I just don't... You got medieval tactical nuke. Yeah, and we're getting far away from the technology aspect yes. of it. So let's go and circle back. Let's let's jump into the Milter. bag of holding. Oh. What? Oh my God. <laughs> Militarization. Mil- so military technology. Yeah. Uh, again, I think that when we say, when we give the baseline of 1500s, I think that arquebuses, I think cannons are fun. Cannons are fun. I think cannons are really cool. You can take a hard stance. Yeah. Blowing stuff up is cool. Blowing stuff up is cool. But I think that we really should talk about cannons and what it does to the setting overall, because what cannons did to medieval times is essentially ruin the idea of a castle. And plate armor wasn't so grand anymore. Right. With the with the advent of arm with the advent of gunpowder and whatnot, you're looking at armor being completely or mostly ineffectual. However, let's talk about where that where the gunpowder comes from. And how it affects, where did it come from? How does it spread? How widespread is it? Is my question. Because I imagine that we're not looking at something that's too terribly widespread yet. No, I could I, I, I could see it being very rare. There might be people who are trying their hand at it, but it's kind of like they're making janky guns that you have an equal shot of it exploding in your face. Like, there's the finely crafted flintlock, and then there's kind of like a... The hand cannon that's going to explode when you when you shoot it. Yeah, yeah. A.K.A. a goblin cannon. Goblin cannon, yeah. Yeah. So let's let's talk about that. Where Where is this technology coming from, then? Because I feel like with the baseline that we have, do we want to say, okay, this is coming from this place, or, or is, it all, is it all coming from one area... I imagine that that's really boring because I don't want it to be, well, the God of technology is creating all of this technology for the betterment of the world. I like the idea that when we look at each individual piece, the God of fire or the God of the forge are the first ones to make cannons. They're Mm. the first ones to, because when you look at it that way, fire plus forge and you're creating cannons there, it's a match made in heaven. Yeah. They're the only ones who understand like metallurgy enough to make a cannon that won't explode. Like maybe uh the this Hondasa is like no no we we can do this. We 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 know we we get it. We get it. We get it. We get it. Yeah. Maybe to to kind of piggyback on on your idea, maybe the only reason that some of this technology works and going back to the Magitech thing is because the god is the one who or or the magic or, or the, the magical effect of the gods are the ones that are holding it together. So normally a god of like this iron cannon would explode apart, but because they're coming from the worshippers of the god of iron. And they're making some sort of alloy of magic and everything. Whereas if a city outside of here was trying to forge it, they would actually have to backwards engineer making an alloy. Right, they would they would have to find a way to forge stronger iron into steel without without the blessing of the iron god, something like that. So you have these spikes here and there where this okay, this this is strictly now turning into technology and magic. And we're gonna transition this into mag full magic next time. Yeah. I think that this is really important because when you have a world that's so steeped in magic, we can only talk about technology so much. We can get a baseline. We can get a talk about how it's going to work. I think it's also very important to discern for the people who may be this now third group that we're coming up that wants to split away from the gods. Because mm-hmm. if they don't have any access to technology or anything, they're, they're, they're in for a bad time. They're like, oh God, all the crops are dying. Right, and especially when they don't have favor of the gods or anything like Which that. Which I could see being... You know, a bad time for them at first where they're just like, God has clearly forsaken us. Oh, wait, no, it's nature. <laughs> oh, wait. Oh, no. Wait oh, minute. God, it's the God of nature. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay. So I, I like I like where this is going. I like the idea that we're forced to really sit down and talk about technology and, and magic and how they kind of interplay with one another. We've created at least one other continent now to kind of talk about. Because, again, if we're talking about technology in the age of sail... And exploration, what I like about that is, you know, the exploration part. Yeah. And I think that 
when you look back on the 1500s, you're also going to look at you're go, you're also going to look at the Aztecs meeting the conquistadors and Columbus and Portugal and all of a sudden that map, oh man, that map's getting filled in now. That map is becoming expanded and I think that's actually one of the things that I'd love to explore in this setting as well is the idea that, well, we used to have two continents, but we recently found a third one. And if you want to talk about a third splinter group that is looking to get away from the influence of the gods, that essentially sounds like the Quakers. That essentially sounds like the the pilgrims who escape England for religious... They were extremists and... We're they were still dealing with it today. <laughs> absolutely. They were they were 100% extremists and they were I mean look at sinners in the eyes of an angry god. That's what they were, you know, escaping persecution from. But now we look at it from the opposite way where there's some kind of utopia project that is being built to oh no, hold on, wait a minute. Are just are we just creating rapture from BioShock? No, 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 it's not underwater or above. Oh no, no, but that we're also teetering dangerously close to Anne Rand. Like no kings, no gods, just men. We gotta we gotta be careful about how we do this. No, no, listen, listen. Every person deserves the sweat of their brow. <laughs> you can't even finish that seriously. No. And I won't let you finish that seriously. Um Alright, but We can't we cannot have a bunch of fierce and Rand breeding motherfuckers creating this extra. That is their god. No. Hard veto. Hard veto. Um, However, what I would accept is this idea that the group that initially discovered this continent, this new continent, would be a group like that. You know, it's it's a group. They're like, we're gonna go build a utopic society, and then they build it, and then all of a sudden they're besieged by. It's kind of like how the Vikings settled in the New World, and then all of a sudden were wiped out by the native peoples. Mm. Similarly, yeah, peaceful. No. All right. So next time we're gonna be doing magic. Next time we're definitely talking about magic. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything else that we want to touch on when it comes to technology? I guess this would just be a personal thing. Uh, I don't believe you're into hard sci-fi. I'm I'm okay with hard sci-fi. Oh, I mean, yeah, I've never had a problem with that. You ever uh, read uh, Hyperion? No, I can't. I can't say I have. I, that's the thing. I haven't read much sci-fi, uh. or or rather, much hard sci-fi. I mean, I've read um, Childhood's End and a couple other Arthur C. Clarke stuff. I've not yeah. really. To segue from that, uh, in both a storytelling aspect. Do you want people to know how everything works? Like, I, I feel like it should be a bit of a mystery of why are they able to build cannons? And and for other people to try and figure it out. And like, maybe one melodrist in a... Metallurgist. I was getting there. Uh, figured out the secret, but he also doesn't want to give it away because he's making bank selling his, yeah. his rifles. That's actually a really smart point to touch on as well. There's a great book called The Perfect Red, which talks about the dyers guilds and how they would literally murder people for giving away pieces of information about how they got the specific hue of color for because that was their business. That was yeah. their entire business. And you look at all of the mercantile leagues that take place in Italy that are all based around, look, we have the best cheese this is our this is how they build their empire is they have the most profitable, tastiest and best cheese. Yeah. And I think that's really a really important aspect to touch upon as well is how money driven the technological aspect of our world would be. The other thing that I really like cuz I love crafting, I love things like that. Have you ever heard of uh, going to butcher another word today? Uh Erfbert swords? I'm sorry, you're going to have to repeat that slowly into Earth the microphone. Bert swords. Earthbert. Yep. Or Ulfbert. Ulfbert. I've not heard of this. Please so, explain. So it was a sword that they found uh, throughout pretty much wherever the Vikings were, but they were incredibly rare, and they were made pristine. They didn't rust, they didn't do anything, and it was apparently this... One person or one family of blacksmiths that were able to make these amazing swords that did not rust, did not lose their edge, 
and it was from using this very, very strange, uh, I watched an entire YouTube about how some guy replicated it, and it was a process that if you messed up even the slightest, the sword became brittle and would just shatter, hmm. and of course, the reason that it has its name is because he engraved his name on all of the swords, and there were, oh, that's and cool. here's the thing that I love. They also found lots of uh, copycat fake ones that weren't as good that would shatter, oh but someone goodness. engraved the name on it. So and it's, so I it's want like a... I want like the the uh, the person who's making these rifles and everything, but not with uh, divine magic to like put his name on it and also want to be secretive because they're just like those guys over there will fucking kill me if they know that I'm making rifles, fake rifles. Yeah. Like that. Oh yeah, that's fun. So you're essentially suggesting that Rolex watches are, <laughs> are going to be prevalent. That's actually really they're still good. They tell time most of the time. <laughs> I didn't remember there being a 61st second, but who knew? Listen, you can set an alarm. <laughs> I, but, go, go, but being serious, I, I actually really enjoy that idea that... I, and I think what we're doing is we're also mimicking the kind of uh, caste system that you see in, a t in, that, in that particular historical setting where merchants are now becoming their own separate cast of people essentially where they're not necessarily uh, royalty they're not of royal blood but they no, they are of import right they're not they're not necessarily the biggest movers and shakers they're not national powers that you have to fear but you have to respect them and you have to give them credit and you have because you want that technology to spread you want rifles if you if you need them you want you know, I, I'm, sh and this is the thing, because we're talking at it from a from a purely building, adventuring side, we're we're also losing out on a lot of the cool technology that exists around non warfare. Not like there's, I'm sure that there's like astrolabes and compasses and all sorts of building materials that are new to what we're talking about. We're just ignorant of the fact. Oh yeah, like. Uh, navigation technology is something that I would have to research to see of the time period. Yeah. Uh, different farming technology I would have to look up. Uh, I know that they had uh, plenty of armor that was made thicker and everything to fight uh, kind of the rifles and everything. It wasn't... Didn't work out very well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, it was... It still looked pretty. Yes, yes, that's very true. So that's That's a good point. That's... But again, we're we're in this point where we're in this nebulous area between technology and magic, and man, I'm I'm having a lot of fun though. I'm I'm having a lot of fun. I, I'm I'm glad that we've kind of picked down an era to kind of emulate and what we want to explore. So going back to our email from Detlef, I did actually want to talk about how you want to handle outlier technology, places in the world that are either really advanced or really behind. What do you think that that would add to the overall world? Is there some kind of a race or technology that exists that is so far beyond what the world already knows? I think that we talked about this in the in the very first episode, the idea that there is perhaps these gods are starting over. So we're not talking about a pure post-apocalypse situation, but in a certain aspect, we kind of are. I would like some aspect of technology that has existed before that is advanced. The main roadblocks that I would have to put in, why can't it be replicated? Why can't it be reproduced? Why hasn't it replaced existing technology? And most of the things that I come up with is either it's of limited use, in which case, why hasn't it been used in 10,000 years? Or it breaks easily, so you need to save it mm. in case something happens. Part of me wants to, part of me has this idea of a, 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 a global power that is less based on the power of their god and more power. Like they essentially just got a huge boost in power from finding a source of this advanced technology. And it's, it's, it was advanced for the time, but now that the world is catching up, they're becoming less and less powerful and perhaps that they're part of some hedonistic empire that is on the decline. I, I think that's something that we can explore in a future episode. But. I would also say that they, they want to delve deeper. They want to delve further into whatever ruins they're looking at because they're like, Oh God, we're, we're not as important as we were. 
and we can get into some kind of darkest dungeon situation where yes. the more irrelevant they become, the more desperate they become to find technology. And then at that point, you start dealing with uh, pacts and all sorts of all sorts of nasty, dark stuff that happens in the world. And I feel like, for the most part, when you do this in a magical setting, if they're isolated, that they're relying more on their god. Sure. Because they don't need the technology. They're fervent. They're a small community. Their god is everything to them. Their god is the end-all, be-all. And moreover, I think when it comes to that, it... They are often one of those anti-tech... They're essentially a Luddite civilization yeah. where they they cast off technology specifically because their god says it's bad or, or that's what their dogma essentially mm. says. Why would we need technology? That makes us stray further from God. Right, right. Something like that. I think that makes a lot of sense. Is there any other aspect of either... Because I feel like those are fairly typical... You know, the, the advance in the... Is there anything else that we want to talk about in terms of an outlier civilization? When we talk about... I, I Sorry, I just got an idea. For that advanced tech, do we want it to just be like, hey, we found steel really early or like some kind of really powerful metal, but they don't know how to work it? Do you want to kind of combine the two ideas where it's their god doesn't allow the use of technology, but they also just so happen to be on a vein of really advanced tech. So it's a matter of we have swords and shields made up of hyper alloy titanium. So they have these primitive, almost stone stone age era weapons, but, but they're made out of like bullets are ricocheting off of them. They're just like, the fuck? yes, I, I think that I think that's actually pretty fun. One other thing that I would like to add to possibly either this or another existing race and this is something that I, I, I realize could be used to explain why it's not widespread and the technology hasn't spread. It's made for an alien f physiology. So maybe it's for something that's too big. So you can't use the calculator of a giant kind of thing. Sure. I, I'm not sure how that would... I think that would be a little bit more applicable to the underground where these... The Forgotten... Because yeah. I, I, I'm finding that the Forgotten that you added are becoming a really easy way for us to just kind of be like, yeah, just shoehorn them in. That's yeah, cool. but, but it works. I think it works really well. And moreover, I think that when you add in, they are a degenerated race. Like they were once larger, different physiology, mm. and they explain away a lot of that technology that exists. They're no longer smart enough to use it. This needs three hands. What the hell? Right. Or what is the, how does this even work? Like, it, it's, it, it requires some kind of an interface with an... Un Squiggly arm goes yeah, inside. Right. And, and you just can't do that. But... Duck penis. A duck penis? Yeah. 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 Summon... It, it summon that. Yeah, yeah, summon a dire duck. Oh, no. Just, just dress that part up like a lady duck. And then summon a bunch of dire ducks. Wang, wang, wang. Oh, this is just the worst segue we've ever had. Edit this all out, please. I refuse. This is going in. So, but to get back to where we before the duck penises, to get back to the technology, I, I think that blending those two would be really fun. Having a, a primitive society that just so happens to have really advanced tech in a lot of ways, but they're using it wrong. So they're not utilizing it to its fullest potential. Like, like a they, propeller blade that's been turned into a sword. Oh, that's, yeah, something like that. Or, or let's say that they have a chainsaw sword from 40K, but they're using it like a club or something <sighs> like that. Or like they don't know. Or maybe they're just using it as a saw and not just the sword. I believe this is from a BPRD, but there was the guy who had just like the impossibly sh sharp sword and would be using it constantly to like... He would be falling down something and he would catch it in a rock to slow his fall. Well, that's just a thing that happens like that. I know, I yeah. know. But it was the fact that the sword itself he found in like a tomb underground and it was covered by a bunch of bodies and a bunch of rusted armor and it was just this death grip that had the sword. I like that idea. I like the idea of misused technology. Of mi Like if the, if the race were to come back to be like, you've been using it for what? What the... You don't understand what... Oh, no. Like, I, I like that you idea. You made 
chain mail out of spoons? Oh, <laughs> no, no, no. Hold on, hold on. All right, idea. How about something akin to you're using a jet engine to roast a pig over? Something something like that, where it's not just, uh, hey, it works. I mean, you know, where nowadays we'll call them like hillbilly hacks or just, you know, oh, look at this cool life hack. It's like, oh, no, you're just misusing the technology. Stop it. Stop it. You look dumb. You you do, in fact, look a dumb. Yes. All right. All right. Yeah. I like this. All right. Yeah. Look up hillbilly hacks. I don't think that's a thing. I think I just made that no. up. No. There, there's a whole subreddit on it. Oh, no. Oh, man. Gotten some good ideas from that, which is embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. How's the move been, by the way? Just fantastic. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, I feel like we've... I feel like we've covered a lot of really good ground today and, and set a really great baseline for technology. And moreover, I think we've set ourselves up to talk about magic and everything to do with magic. Magic might even be a two-part two part story because... With the divine being so important. Right. We, we have to talk about where magic comes from, how it's applied and how it works. It, there's a lot to it. I mm. think that there's a lot to explore. And if you have any ideas about how and why you want to explore magic with us next week, you can email us at worldbuildwithus at gmail.com. Or if you just want to send us an email, let us know how well we've done. Or, oh, and this is also, this is also really important. We've just launched on uh, Google Play, Spotify, iTunes, iTunes, all the big ones. This is our first episode since essentially publishing and actually looking for viewership outside of our friend group. So to all of those who are listening, welcome. Thank you so much for your support. I love you. I can't speak to Chris, but... I I, I like you. Wow. Okay, Ruben. We're good friends. He's I'm getting a friend vibe from the audience. What of it? Look, I well, I I'm just happy that you're around, sticking with us as we bullshit and you listen to us. Uh, I, I'm not going to tell you to subscribe and smash the like button. Ring that bell. Don't ring the bell. Ring that bell. You don't have to ring the bell. I'm going to do this you. voice all next episode. However, if you do like what we're doing, spreading the word about us is important. Getting viewership, watching that number on the Podbean app go up makes us feels good. And, I mean, you know, why not support some local independent guys doing stuff that they really enjoy? I'm not sure if it's true, but I have been telling people I'm now internet famous. I mean, I wouldn't say internet. I mean... Internet famous. Right up there with Ninja. Oh, no. No. (laughs) Both of us. Both of us are just as important as him. Stop flossing. (laughs) Never. (laughs) Sit back down in the chair and stop flossing. I will never stop flossing. Anyway, this has been World Build with us. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Rob Hilferty here with Chris Prunty, and we'll see you next time. We love you very much. Goodbye.